It's Sergio's birthday, so it has been for a long time, it was for him, his special day. It then became a special day for Annie, for Laurent and Adrien. And now, although we didn't want it to become this way, it's now all of us, our special day to remember Sergio Vieira de Mello, to remember his vision and his values. As Anne Willem said, he's very much missed. And if Sergio was here today with us, as we would so much like him to be, what would he have said to all of us? Well, 20 years ago in this very city, he spoke movingly about refugees. He spoke in 1997, just three years after the Rwandan genocide, and I quote, the region remains on a knife edge. The scales may tip towards continued unrest, furthering conflict or war, or we hope the consolidation of peace. And we want to say, if we demand the respect of minimum humanitarian standards time and again, it is because this is one of the prerequisites for peace. A region on a knife edge, perhaps a world on a knife edge. His words, and not surprisingly, still resonate today. Last month, there was an echo of his spirit in an op-ed written by another humanitarian of our time, and she wrote, every time we depart from our values, we worsen the very problem we are trying to contain. We must never allow our values to become collateral damage in our search for greater security. So wrote Angelina Jolie, the UN Special Envoy, actor, activist, and end of this month, an academic, having taught her first class at the London School of Economics. Congratulations. She is with us in conversation along with Filippo Grandi, who, like Sergio, found his first job in UNHCR and has never left. It is his natural home and a conversation which will include all of you. But first, let us, in this special moment, listen to a special address. And it comes at a very important moment. A speech entitled, The Defense of Internationalism by Angelina Jolie. Good evening. I am truly honored to be here with you tonight. And thank you to the Foundation for inviting me, and thank you all for sharing in this moment. We are here in the memory of Sergio Vieira de Mello and the 21 other men and women, most of them UN workers, who died with him in the bombing of the UN headquarters in Baghdad, August 2003. We remember all those who died to acknowledge each valuable life cut short and the families who share even today in their sacrifice. We also remember them for the power of the example they set, brave individuals from 11 different countries working to help the Iraqi people at the direction of the United Nations Security Council and on behalf of all of us this is sometimes forgotten, that in serving under the UN flag, they died in our names as our representatives. And at their head, Sergio was a man of extraordinary grace and ability, as many who knew him will testify. A man who gave 30 years to the United Nations, rising from a field officer to High Commissioner for Human Rights and Special Representative to Iraq from Bangladesh to Bosnia to South Sudan to East Timor, he spent the majority of his career in the field, working alongside people forced from their homes by war and assisting them with his skill as a diplomat and a negotiator. Perhaps the greatest testament to his contribution is how much his advice would be valued today. As the Syrian conflict enters its seventh year, 
as we live through the gravest refugee crisis since the founding of the United Nations, as 20 million people are on the brink of death from starvation in Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, and Southeast Nigeria, I cannot imagine that there is anyone in the leadership of the United Nations who would not welcome the opportunity to consult Sergio or to send him into the field once more. He is truly missed. It is humbling for me to speak tonight in the presence of members of Sergio's family and his former colleagues. I never knew Sergio, but I have stood before the plaque in the place where he died. I felt profound sadness at the fact that the conflict in Iraq, the source of so much Iraqi suffering to this day, had claimed the lives of men and women whose only intention was to try to improve a desperate situation. But I also saw clearly the value and nobility of a life spent in service to others. Sergio was a man who never turned down an assignment, no matter how difficult and dangerous, or as others have put it, who handled one impossible task after another. He was a man, to borrow the words of Thomas Paine, whose country was the world, whose religion was to do good. He will always remain a hero and inspiration to all who follow in his footsteps. The UN's work did not end there, in the rubble of Canal House 14 years ago. Hundreds of UN staff have served and continue to serve in Iraq, as they do from Afghanistan to Somalia, because the task of building peace and security can never be abandoned, no matter how bleak the situation. My thoughts on Sergio's life and legacy derive from my 16 years with UNHCR, the agency he spent so much of his career serving and representing. But I also speak as a citizen from my country, the United States. I believe all of us who work with the UN preserve this duality. The United Nations is not a country. It is a place where we come together as nations and people to try to resolve our differences and to unite in common action. As a citizen, I find myself looking out on a global environment that seems more troubling and uncertain than any time in my lifetime. And I imagine many of you feel the same. We are grappling with a level of conflict and insecurity that seems to exceed our will and capabilities. With more refugees than ever before, with new wars erupting on top of existing conflicts, some already lasting decades. We see a rising tide of nationalism masquerading as patriotism and the reemergence of policies encouraging fear and hatred of others. We see some politicians elected partly on the basis of dismissing international institutions and agreements, as if our countries have not benefited from cooperation but actually been harmed by it. We hear some leaders talking as if some of our proudest achievements are in fact our biggest liabilities, whether it is the tradition of successfully integrating refugees into our societies or the institutions and treaties we have built rooted in law and human rights. We see nations that played a role, a proud role, in the founding of the International Criminal Court withdrawing from it on the one hand, and on the other, we see arrest warrants for alleged war crimes issued but not implemented, and other crimes ignored altogether. We see a country like South Sudan, ushered by the international community into independence, and then largely abandoned, not by the UN agencies and NGOs, but effectively abandoned without the massive support they need to make a success of sovereignty. And we see resolutions and laws on the protection of civilians and the use of chemical weapons, for instance, flouted repeatedly, and in some cases, under the cover of Security Council vetoes, as in Syria. 
Many of these things are not new, but taken together and in the absence of strong international leadership, they are deeply worrying. When we consider this, all of this and more, as citizens, what is our answer? Do we, as some would encourage us to think, turn our backs on the world and hope that the storm will pass? Or do we strengthen our commitment to diplomacy and to the United Nations? I strongly believe there is only one choice, demanded by reason as well as by conscience, which is the hard work of diplomacy and negotiation and reform of the UN. This is not to say that in any way this is an easy road. And there are reasons for people to feel insecure today. The level of conflict and lack of solutions combined with the fear of terrorism, the reality that globalization has brought vast benefits to some and worsened the lot for others, the sense of disconnect between citizens and governments, or in some countries, the lack of governance, the overall feeling that for all our gains in technology and connectedness, the less we are in control of forces shaping our lives. All these factors and more have contributed to a sense of a world out of balance. And there are no easy answers. And despite the millions of people who have lifted themselves out of poverty in our lifetime, the difference between the lives of those of us born in wealthy, democratic societies and those born into slums and refugee camps in the world is a profound injustice. We see it, and we know it's wrong at a simple human level. That inequality is contributing to instability, conflict, and migration, as well as to the sense that the international system serves the few at the expense of the many. But again, what? What is our answer as citizens? Do we withdraw from the world where before we felt a responsibility to be part of the solutions? I am a proud American, and I am an internationalist. I believe anyone committed to human rights is. It means seeing the world with a sense of fairness and humility and recognizing our own humanity in the struggles of others. It stems from a love of one's country, but not at the expense of others from patriotism, but not from narrow nationalism. It includes the view that success isn't being greater than others, but finding your place in a world where others succeed too. And that a strong nation, like a strong person, helps others to rise up and be independent. It is the spirit that made possible the creation of the UN, out of the rubble and ruin and 60 million dead of World War II, so that even before the task of defeating Nazism was complete, that generation of wartime leaders was forging the UN. If governments and leaders are not keeping the flame of internationalism alive, then as citizens, we must. The challenge is how to restore that sense of balance and hopefulness in our countries, while not sacrificing all we have learned about the value and necessity of internationalism. Because a world in which we turn our back on our global responsibilities will be a world that produces greater insecurity, violence, and danger for us and for our children. This is not a clash between idealism and realism. It is the recognition that there is no shortcut to peace and security, no substitute for the long, painstaking effort to end conflicts 
expand human rights, and strengthen the rule of law. We have to challenge the idea that the strongest leaders are those willing to dismiss human rights on the grounds of national interests. The strongest leaders are those who are capable of doing both. Having strong values and the will to act upon them doesn't weaken our borders or our militaries. It is their essential foundation. And none of this is to say that the UN is perfect, because of course we know it is not. I have never met a field officer who has not railed against the shortcomings, as I imagine Sergio did in his darkest moments. And he, like all of us, wanted a UN that was more decisive less bureaucratic, and that lived up to his, its standards. But he never said it was pointless, and he never threw in the towel. The UN is an imperfect organization because we are imperfect. It is not separate from us. Our decisions, particularly those made by the Security Council, have played a part in creating the landscape that we are dealing with today. We should always remember why the UN was formed and what it is for, and take that responsibility very seriously. We have to recognize the damage we do when we undermine the UN or use it selectively or not at all, or when we rely on aid to do the job of diplomacy or give the UN impossible tasks and then underfund it. For example, today, there is not a single humanitarian appeal anywhere in the world that is funded even by half of what is required. In fact, worse than that, appeals for countries on the brink of famine today are 17%, 7%, 5% funded, for example. And of course, emergency aid is not the long-term answer. No one prefers that kind of aid. Not citizens of donor countries, not governments, not refugees. They do not want to be dependent. It would be far better to be able to invest all of our funds in infrastructure and schools and trade and enterprises. But let's be clear, emergency aid has to continue because many states cannot or will not protect the rights of citizens around the world. It is what we spend in countries where we have no diplomacy or our diplomacy is not working. And until we do better at preventing and reducing conflict, we are doomed to be in a cycle of having to help feed or shelter people when societies collapse. As another legendary UN leader, who was also killed in the line of duty, Dag Hammarskjöld said, everything will be all right. You know when? When people, just people, stop thinking of the United Nations as a weird Picasso abstraction and see it as a drawing they make themselves. The UN can only change if governments change their policies and if we, as citizens, ask governments to do that. It is moving, if you think about it. We are the future generations envisioned in the UN Charter. When our grandparents resolved to spare future generations the scourge of war, as written, they were thinking of us. But as well as dreaming for our safety, they also left us a responsibility. President Roosevelt, addressing the U.S. Congress in January 1945, six months before the end of World War II, said this, In the field of foreign policy, we promise to stand together with the United Nations, not for the war alone, but for the victory for which the war was fought. And he went on, The firm foundation can be built, and will be built, 
but the continuance and assurance of a living peace in the long run must be the work of the people themselves. So today we have to ask ourselves if we are living up to that mission. They gave us the start. What have we done with it? It is clear to me that we have made huge strides, but our agreements and institutions are only as strong as our will to uphold them. If we do not, for whatever reason, we bequeath a darker, more unstable world to all of those who come after us. It is not for this that previous generations shed blood and worked so hard on behalf of all of us. The memory of those who came before us holds us true to our ideals, resting unchanged in time. They remind us who we are and what we stand for. They give us hope to stay in the fight, as Sergio did until his last breath. Fourteen years since his death, there is a stronger need than ever before for us to stay true to the ideals and purposes of the United Nations. That is what I hope his memory holds for us today. We cannot all be Sergios, but I hope all of us can determine that we shall be a generation that renews its commitment to unite our strength to maintain international peace and security and to promote social progress and better standards of life and larger freedom. But in the final analysis, if we do not, even if that level of vision eludes us, and we continue to simply manage rather than overcome our generation's challenges. We just have to keep working, determinedly, patiently. And you can be certain that as you do, that you follow the example of one of the UN's finest sons. And that to do even a little of his good to apply ourselves to the work he left unfinished in whatever way we can is a worthy task for all of us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a very sober, a very clear-eyed assessment of our world. A world out of balance, says Angelina Jolie. A world where there's an absence of leadership. A world which, she says, is more troubled and uncertain than at many other times before. And her question, what is the answer? Well, it's us. All of us. And it calls for more diplomacy, not less. More UN, not less. Because the UN, as imperfect as it is, it's all there is. And it too is us. Filippo Grandi, you wear your, the United Nations curses through your veins. You've worked in it for so long. Angelina Jolie, in the spirit of Sergio, is a clarion call for more international engagement, and yet we live in a time where governments seem to be in retreat. You go to these capitals. What is your answer to Angelina Jolie's question at the moment in which we meet? Thank you. Before I answer this impossible question, <laughs> I just want, I hope I interpret everybody's sentiments in thanking Angelina for a marvelous speech. I thank you. <laughs> that, that although she is a fantastic um, special envoy 
for the High Commissioner for Refugees, this speech goes far beyond that call of duty and really is, as you said, Liz, a clarion call for all of us to reflect on the importance of internationalism. Uh, I, I want to also say, first of all, I am not very clear-eyed. I was very tear-eyed listening to her, so forgive me if I'm a little bit emotional here. But I just want to link it to, uh, to, to Sergio and what he represents, has represented and still represents for many of us in the United Nations system. You know, I, when, uh, I think I may have said this already in public, so forgive Forgive me if some of you have heard me say that, but I remember that when Sergio left UNHCR, and this must have been 97, 98, he gathered all staff and gave a speech. And at the end of his speech, uh, the first question was, so really, what is your main advice to us who remain here in UNHCR? And he said, he said don't stay here. Don't stay in Geneva. Go out there. That's where your work is important. And I think that this, you know, I've worked with him a little bit. Many of you have worked with him a lot more. His family, of course, is here. I think that uh, all, all in, during all his life, his fight was to do the job of the UN, exactly as you described, Angelina, which was to create that space where people come together with profoundly different uh, opinions and points of view and feelings and create a space where solutions to the problems, to the conflicts would be searched and would be found, because that was very important for him, but would be found on the basis of principles. And Angelina, you said something so important that it, this is not about uh, uh, idealism against realism. And I think all his life, his leitmotiv was trying to marry these two, to be realistic, but to maintain uh, uh, the faithfulness to principles and to idealism. This is very difficult, but I think that in this world, and this is your question, Liz, in this world in which principles have become sometimes almost embarrassing, in the words of our political leaders because they are perceived and presented as, uh, 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 as words that make people lose elections. I think in this very difficult context, that marriage of idealism and realism, that creation of a space where people get together, different people get together and find solutions is still, must still be our guiding direction. And I think that although that space is becoming very narrow and we must raise an alarm in that sense, we still have the possibility to fight for it, to find it, and to bring people there to talk to each other. We do this every day. Our field officer, those who have heeded the call of Sergeant and are out there, as Angelina said, uh, fighting for refugees, fighting for displaced people, those that do the same for human rights, for food security, for the rights of children, of women, those people do that better than anybody else. So we need to also follow them, support them, and I do believe still, as I think Sergio believed until his very last day, that that space can be found and can be utilized to move forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Um... Filippo, thank you. I know today's a, a personal day for you too. And thank you, Angelina Jolie, for your, for your clarity. And of course, a year ago, you talked very pointedly and, to, and you sp spoke in very clear terms to the leaders of the United Nations and, and echoing what Antonio Guterres said at the time, that the system was broke, financially broke, and broken, that it had to be fixed. A year on, do you find any hope in the fact that at least there's a recognition as you said, that it's not perfect. There's a greater public recognition that something has to be done, and that's the first step to addressing it. Have you seen, do you see now any sense of knowing what to do, even if it hasn't been done yet? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know if any, anybody who's worked within the system, we ever actually thought it was perfect. 
<laughs> but I, I, do, I do think that we, you know, when we raised it and we talked about how we want to make changes and how we want to step forward, we speak about it from a loving place. We speak about it as a place of people that have, have a faith, that understand what it is for. We, we, we want to nurture it forward. We want to make adjustments to meet this day, to meet the challenges of today, to adjust with the different generational uh, challenges. I think the concern for today is that people are taking advantage of that constructive uh, support to change criticism and turning it into uh, a, a very kind of over, oversimplified criticism of works or doesn't work. Useful, not yet, and it doesn't really discuss and address. We all want, and we don't want it to, to you know, our interest isn't to, to adjust and move the UN forward because we want to figure out how to, you know, are we save money here or there or do this. We want to move it forward because we, more than anybody, we would like UNHCR not to have to exist. You know, we, we would like to start to, we would like conflicts to end. We would, anybody that works in aid relief wants to not have to bring aid relief into the field. But if we're going to do it, we want the understanding, the support, the logistics, the right way to do it. And when we do it, and when we spend years doing it, and I've seen so many people, I've seen field officers crying, putting people back on buses to go back to a country that they know is not ready to, to receive them because the funds have dried up in the host country, because the world wants a headline of how many people returned, and they know the infrastructure is not prepared, and they know the country that's in post-conflict is not ready. And, and all of these things break our heart because we see that we work so hard, but we would like to finish the job. We would like to see countries on their feet. We would like to see people have, you know, move forward. And, and really, we would like to see a more stable world. And what we're seeing is the, the world breaking down in more ways and, and, uh, and the use of all of our efforts, um, as I said, sometimes in the place of what should be diplomacy and ending conflicts and where aid is used in the wrong way, so. Let me pick up, you describe yourself as an internationalist, but also a proud American citizen. If instead of sitting with Filippo and I, you were sitting with two people who've taken on new jobs, Antonio Guterres, who's the UN Secretary General, just two months, three months into the jobs, President Trump, just two to three months in the job, what advice would you give them especially in a week where there could be an announcement of cuts to the United Nations. <laughs> you can answer that as you see fit. <laughs> it's not meant to be a political question. It's meant to how do they work together, the, one of the most powerful nations on earth with one of the most powerful institutions on, on, on earth. Well, I've had the good fortune of working with uh, Guterres when he was high commissioner. Guterres comes from, uh, he's a man who has worked in the field. He has seen with his own eyes. He is very much a man of the world. And, and uh, I've, I've been with him in tents, see him connect and understand and, and, uh, you know, the issue from a very, in a very practical way. I, uh, I don't feel I'd need to advise him as he's a man who's given me much advice and lives and breathes this and understands it. Um, I think in that room I would try to rep my, represent myself as somebody who does, um, who as an American, I, America has been in the past, our relationship to the United Nations. We, we are supportive of the United Nations. We have been a funder of the United Nations. We have been a country, we are a country, founded on values, who we are, who American citizens are, and what we expect of our leadership um, is to remember those values and carry those values forward and understand the connection of those values and our relationship to the United Nations and nations around the world. So. I would speak uh, from, from that place. In the heart. Let me take a question from a student. Let me first hand up that I see. This woman here, straight down the center, with the long hair. And please identify, I'm not sure. um, identify yourself and what you plan to be in 10 years time. Hi, my name is Shrai Mishta. I'm the UN Youth Representative for Caring for Cambodia. Oh. I've obviously heard a lot about Ms. Jolie's work over the many years. Um, so the world is now seeing the largest generation of young people, 1.8 billion. And as someone engaged in the youth and development space, my biggest question would be, how do we translate 
this idea that peace is definitely realistic and not just an idealistic concept. Thank you. Well, I think Cambodia is a good country to, to think of when you think of that. Um, they saw, an ex you know, 40 years ago, uh, a horrendous war that killed a quarter of the population, and I think they imagined there would never be peace. Um, it is complex now, but it is peaceful. Um, I think I th it's, it's just, you know, there, there are... There are more conflicts today around the world raging and, and unending than maybe ever before. I, I think it feels like the world is on fire, and I imagine your generation feels like we've left you with this terrible mess to clean up and so much to do. And, and, uh, and I would say to look to the past uh, and to look to the UN Charter, to look to the human rights, uh, the, the laws that protect, they, they are there. It is how they have, uh, whether they have not been implemented, whether they need to be strengthened. Um, it's what you will do with them, but I think there's a framework there that you will be able to find and hopefully build upon much better than, than I think has been, uh, much better than has been done in the last uh, few decades. There's, there's a lot that's changed, and there's a, lot that, uh, there's a lot that we need you for. We really do need the youth to, to speak up. You are interconnected in a way um, and more aware of the world in a way through social media and other technologies than, than we ever were. And so your interconnectedness uh, can maybe cause sometimes to, f to, to be misused when there's mis misinformation, mismedia or certain things, but it can also be the most powerful tool to connect you and make sure that you keep yourself aware and, uh, and uh, so in support of each other and networking together in a way where you demand the, the world that, that uh, has been given to you. Thank you. If you wanted to say something. Do you yes. see greater hope in Cambodia? Do you? I also wanted to respond to this important question in addition to what Angelina already said. Three quick things, two for the youth and one for the old people. For the youth, first, learn a lot. In a world of factoids, I think it's good to learn about the facts. This is very, very important. And you are still, the young people are still in the phase where learning is possible. There's time, there's opportunities, and you have a lot of great opportunities. The second message is for the old people. We need to give you space. I always tell the story in my previous job when I dealt with other refugees, the Palestinian refugees, we gathered once 25 young Palestinian refugees and put them in front of a bunch of world leaders. And we asked them to ask something to the leaders. They did not ask anything material. They just said, can you please give, a, give us a voice? And when you plan things for us, can you ask us what we want? And the third message is again for the youth people. Please don't be discouraged. Sometimes it is so terrible, it is so frustrating, it is so maddening what you hear and what you have to deal with, but stay the course, continue, because we need that faith in the future and that energy that you have to be able to, uh, to move forward. And Madame Cote is going to test you on that to make sure you remembered all those, all those points at the Graduate Institute. The next question. This, this, this lady here. And who wants to have a question after her so we can get a microphone? Where's another? Okay. And the next question after will be this lady. The, well, the power to the women it will be this woman over here. But your question first. Hi, my name is Isabel Paxton. I'm just an undergrad student. Um, but as a young person coming of age in a world full of violence and uncertainty, it's easy to feel really small um, and insignificant while really wanting to make an impact. So especially coming from a country that just elected a leader um, who seems to dismiss organizations like the UN and the vulnerable communities that they try so desperately to protect. So what advice do you have for students and youth, especially young women, who want to make a difference but don't know where to begin? Thank you. Never describe yourself as just an undergraduate. It's a very special, special congratulations on being just an undergraduate. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, you know, we just, we don't know what we're capable of, do we, any one of us. Um, 
I started, I, I grew up in American, like yourself, I grew up in a town that, uh, that doesn't focus on these issues. Um, I grew up in a, in a place where I, I didn't really know, there was so much of the world I didn't know, my education was lacking in, in, in countries like the real true history of what happened in Cambodia and many, many aspects of the world. I did not have the benefit of a, of a really strong education that, that taught me all that I would later need to know. And so my way was to start to read more and try to get a backpack on and go into the field and meet people from around the world and ask a lot of questions and and try to, and, and then you run into, I'm sure you already have, I mean, everybody in this room, everybody who goes to school together, you're all, you all care about the right thing, the center thing, the center thing that is important to to, to, to life and you support each other and, and you will find there is a whole world of young people out there that feel as strongly as you do and you are from all those countries that need to come together and all this and, and, uh, and so I think it is finding that particular aspect that you love because there's so much to care about. I think sometimes some of us when we work on aid relief we, we, we turn left and right we want to help this person and that person and work on this issue and that issue try to find something or a country or an issue that is really keeps you up at night and uh, and educate yourself and dedicate yourself and find other like-minded people and and see how far you can take it because there really is no nothing limiting you than your own determination will and um, and the fact that you're here and you ask that question already says that you're on your way <laughs> thank you this lady here Hello. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my name is Leila. I'm a, I'm a student at the Graduate Institute. Um, my question is kind of in the same vein, but also um, directed at Ms. Julie and also um, the High Commissioner. Um, for us students, the UN is kind of like the ideal place to work, but in our studies we've also become very critical of the institution and we want to come in and change things, but sometimes I guess we, we hit the bureaucracy and we, did, we get caught up in it, so I was wondering if you had some advice on how to keep this uh, idealism, but at the same time deal with the, with the reality of the bureaucracy and, and kind of deal with the frustration that we might have and how to keep on going. Thank you very much. <laughs> Philippe, you're the bureaucracy, I think. Has <laughs> learned how to figure out how to deal with the bureaucracy, or do we just scream into our pillows? <laughs> I sympathize a lot with that question, <laughs> as I'm sure does the High Commissioner for Human Rights. <laughs> and uh, um, yes, uh, it is true. This is a reality we have to live with. Uh, part of the bureaucracy is because the United Nations is a complex organization, is an organization of all states. And in order for all states to work together and move forward together, uh, many structures have been created to facilitate that. Unfortunately, the tendency of bureaucracy is to feed on itself and grow. So from time to time, I think those of us who have decision-making authority in the, United, in the United Nations have to make tough decisions and cut through all the nonsense that is uh, produced by the bureaucracy and go back to the essentials. But I want to speak about this last, this last concept, the essentials. I think it's important not to be blinded or blindsided, if that's the right word, by the fact that the UN is also such an impossible bureaucracy. And remember that the UN does some very important things. And tonight we heard Angelina speak very eloquently about some of those things. And let me go back to Sergio's advice to us young field officer 20 years ago when he said, go out there where the problem is be with the people that are really the victims of the conflict. Learn their story, try to solve their problems, try to help them solve their problems, and then come back and tell the stories to the others. A lot of the um, fear that uh, we observe today, we in UNHCR anyway, fear for refugees, for the foreigners, is fear produced by ignorance. Now, that ignorance is often fueled by politicians as well, but that fear is founded in the lack of knowledge and familiarity. If you go out there, work with refugees, come back and tell others your story, the story of those refugees that you've been with, you will have given, you have be, 
you, you will have rendered an enormous service in overcoming that fear and restoring that sense of solidarity that is seem so important in the work that we do. You, you probably don't like bureaucracy either, do you, Angelina? <laughs> um, I, um, I, I think it is. It's a, it's a very hard... When I first started working, I came in full of idealism, very little realism. Um, you know, thinking I'd, with my boots on, I could help change the world and we were going to return everybody and there was going to be peace. And, and then you, 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 you realize uh, a lot of the, the hard realities of the world we live in and some things that are really horrible about the, you know, it's, it's not just whether we call it the bureaucracy. We know there, there's also, there's a self, there's, these are individual countries. Some countries can be very selfish. Some countries of their own interests. Some countries block things that they should not block. Some things are, and some people, because, because uh, you know, it puts, it puts field officers, it puts anybody in a very difficult position, you know, because they can't, uh, you know, what do they do? Do they speak up and, and say all the things they can say because they might not, they'd be kicked out of a country and not be able to work within it. It is, uh, it, there's much, um, you will find it is full of these questions. Every, every bit of your work will be, will, will put you in this moment, but, People like Sergio are a great example of he worked right through it. He figured it out. He saw it as a, a kind of puzzle to undo or to, to challenge. And you and, and the High Commissioner is right. The best thing you can do, if it's that guy in some office or some government official that doesn't understand, then somehow we have to make him understand. And some, we have to be in the field. We have to know the people or we have to bring the people to that government official or bring that story or be loud enough or we have to... We have to remind those who are very disconnected of the real world and what is going on because at the end of the day that can sometimes and most often does kick through the, democ the bureaucracy but uh, but not often i think um you know there's a lot that's very frustrating every day for people who work in the u.n you have to just keep keep trying we have time for one last question in the interest of balance i'm going to let there he is the man the brave man who's going to ask a question pity you you've got the last question no pressure hashtag okay. thank you <laughs> my name is michael sam from tanzania uh there are a lot which is unknown to the international community which are done to refugees idps etc now the question is how to bring this into light without fearing retribution Oh, fearing retribution. So is it the balance between justice and peace? Hmm. The, million, yeah. the million dollar yes. question. Yes. Um, I, uh, is it I mean, possible, I think, think, well, I think this is where we're at personally, and I don't know how much to say on it, but I do think you're, you're we cannot, I, I'm somebody who believes very much in, as I said, I first came in and thought this, you know, does it help? We, we care about people. We feel for people. We have beautiful stories and we want to, like, help and we do aid relief and all of that. But at the end of the day, if there isn't justice, if there isn't law, if there isn't an end to impunity, if, if these things carry on, um, we are in this vicious cycle. And so, so at some point, we do have to we have to be brave enough in moments, even if there's going to be retribution, even if We've talked about even if there are moments you wonder sometimes with the UN, can you push it and then they kick you out of a country? But maybe that has to happen to sound the alarm. But what a risk, what a chance to take, because if you're not there, you can't reach the people. But then you stay and you stay under the thumb of whoever is, is kind of making you follow certain rules and you're still not able to reach as many people. So I, I, I guess I would just say we, we have to find a way around it I know there are ways around it. There are ways of working with NGOs who can be louder than the UN um, because they have a different kind of, uh, you know, they're not under the same, the same le level and form of bureaucracy. They can be much louder. They can obviously, they can say many things we cannot say. But we have to strengthen institutions that bring, uh, that, that bring uh, an end to impunity and, and strengthen the law. And, and if we don't do that, then we are just delivering aid and that isn't enough thank you for the answer to the question but thank you too for that final question which brought us back to where i started about sergio's idea of the balance we can tip toward one side or the other and how do you balance justice or peace i'm going to bring this to an end by 
just looking behind Sergio and uh, behind uh, Angelina and Filippo, to honor a life to complete a mission, says Sergio Vero de Mello. Before we move to the very last part of this program, if you had a magic wand and one thing you could do such that next year when this great evening is held again, the world would be in a different place, what would it be, Angelina Jolie? Or Filippo Grandi? You're a bureaucrat, you should be able to answer. <laughs> With a vision, yeah? I think that we should bring here next week some of the people that we have mentioned often tonight. Some refugees, mm. some victims of human rights violations, and let them tell their story. Mm. Just their story. That will be fundamental. I, I absolutely agree, and I think we are in our seventh year of this conflict in Syria. I would very much like to not be in our eighth year. Um, I, would, I would like to see a change in the dialogue internationally in media and around the world. Um, I would like to see a little more respect and, and uh, the, uh, the, the fight for, for human rights, the fight for the international work for the importance of what we do for the interconnectedness for the respect for other cultures other lives refugees the displaced all of us uh, i would i would like to see it not but i would at least pray that it doesn't become worse and i would hope and the hate and the xenophobia does not rise i would i would pray that we can at least push back and i think that's what we all need to do right now is push back and push hard uh, in on behalf of of men like Sergio, who who, uh, who lived and, and uh, gave his life f for this cause. May you both be given the magic wand. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to Angelina Jolie, to Filippo Grandi. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You can, you, want to, you can stay or go down, whatever. Ladies and gentlemen, so many important messages.